Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. I know it's um, field day season as well and it's a busy time, but we're um, excited to do our third Risk Reading Club today. And I think uh, we're getting a presentation from somebody who probably, probably doesn't need any introduction. Um, one of our fearless leaders of RiskWise. Um, so Lindsay, I think I'll go straight over to you and you can get into it. Thanks, Brendan. I don't know about fearless. I don't know if that's the right, right um, adjective, but anyway. Um, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, yeah, so one of the things that in the reading club when we were thinking about papers, I, I suggested maybe we could talk about this one as an idea for a couple of reasons. I thought this one might be a useful prompter for people. One, one is because it deals with risk and obviously balancing risk in, 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 in the grain and mixed farming enterprises. It, and that it looks at price and production risk and tries to isolate both of those things as factors. And I guess the other part to this is that actually this work was done by myself, Andrew Moore and Dean Thomas, and this was done in the Grain and Grays 2 program, which was a very similar sort of style project to the RiskWise project. And so we did this as part of the national fee-based team where we had a similar sort of style to this national project leads. And sort of, I guess the idea was um, we provided analysis and did did cross regional sort of study. So I suppose it's an example of the sort of things that the national project might do in a similar way in risk wise. And so I suppose it had a few different elements to that. So jumping onto the paper, um, I guess this project, this, this particular study was about trying to understand what risk mitigation benefits you get from having a mixed crop and livestock enterprise on your farm. Okay. So that was that was the intent. Um, why was that important? Well, Australia is one of the few places where we have one of the most variable climates and we're and most farmers are exposed to highly variable price um, environment um, due to lack of subsidies and a fairly free trade sort of context. Um, most Australian grain going businesses, not all, but most have a have crop and livestock enterprises on their farm. And so the question I guess that um, comes up is what's the degree of the benefit you get from having that mixed enterprise in terms of the benefits that has and potentially what are some of the trade-offs and I guess if you think about portfolio economics which is the idea you know when you're buying shares um, you try and spread your share portfolio across a few different companies and a few different sectors and the idea is that that's trying to buffer are exposed to. You don't have all your eggs in one basket, you've got it spread across a few and ultimately that means that if one goes belly up, hopefully the other one will cover you and vice versa, right? So that whole idea of portfolio economics, whether that applies in this case for crop lot, for, for, lot, for agricultural enterprises, um, and so how much does that diversification of investment offer in terms of risk mitigation? And I guess one of the challenges are that it's very hard to do that, answer those questions using empirical or statistical information that you might have from farmer data or from other places, because often that's over short periods of time and it's very hard to isolate those effects from other things that are going on. And so what that really lends itself to is a modelling type analysis where you can isolate some of those effects. And I'll explain how, how we did that in a minute. So ultimately, the question we were asking here was how much does having a mix of mix of enterprises, crop and livestock, help us mitigate both price and production risk and how much they contribute to the farm? And trying to do that in the absence of any other synergies that might happen from crop and livestock enterprises, so transfer of nutrients, offsetting nitrogen and those sort of things, so taking them out and also taking out the effects of climate and soil uh, adaptation, right? So their relative, um, the relativities of whether a livestock enterprise is more or less um, suitable to a particular climate or soil and trying to analyse that in isolation. So where do we do this? So we did six case study essentially analysis uh, locations across the southern um, mixed farming zone, Western Australia, Minipa, Wakery, Charlton, Hamilton and Tamora. We did this to capture a few different environments, production systems, um, different farming enterprises and, and, and systems. You look in the paper, there's a big table with all of that data, but effectively there's different cropping systems, different livestock enterprises. They were all calibrated based on talking to a bunch of farmers and advisors to try and get a fairly 
representative farming systems representation. So what we did was we took a long long term climate data and local soil data and we we used that information and then we we took that info and we essentially analyzed a cropping enterprise using AppSim and that was a crop sequence it wasn't just wheat on wheat on wheat that was a wheat canola loop and rotation in western australia and different different cropping sequences in different places so it captures some of those dynamics of the system and equally, we used grass grow or graze plan models to simulate the livestock enterprise. So we did these in, in isolation separately. There's no interactions going on between those two components of, of the farm, if you like. So we did that. Um, so there's an example. So we did a cropping sequence over time. So we had those phased in rotation so that every crop occurred in every part of the part of uh, every year in a similar way to a farm would have phases of rotation that would cycle around in different paddocks across the across a farm. So we tried to represent that, kept that pretty even. Um, and then we equally had different feed bases that contributed to the livestock enterprise. So that generated all of the production outputs from a, from a cropping enterprise and from the livestock enterprise in terms of yield and wool sales and livestock production, all that sort of thing. OK. So the models generated that on a yearly basis across that climate record. And then what we did was we then overlaid those outputs of production with a historical record of time varying costs and prices over the same time frame. Okay, so we had that from ABARES data where we had the prices of different commodities, were they different grain crops, the wool, wool clip, the life, the land prices, and fertilizer import prices. So we allowed those and things to vary, and we used that, we looked at that data. Um, um, to, to populate the, the economic outcome. Um, these were all corrected back to um, 2000 and whatever it was, 2013 dollars. So, so any, um, any of that sort of CPI corrected prices effectively. So we did that. So that was the whole idea. So that gave us this concept of how we could generate estimates of gross margin and the variability in that gross margin that comes from a cropping enterprise and from a livestock enterprise. Okay. So then what we did was we said, okay, we can we can take that production variability over time and we can multiply it by price variability. So that's all cool. And that gives us an estimate of the total variability it might be exposed to in terms of economic outcome for each of those enterprises. But we also then tried to isolate those things. So we allowed production variability to vary, but we took the average price across that whole time frame and it multiplied that through. Equally, we did the same thing where we allowed prices to vary, but took the average production. So that way you could pull apart the effects of price variability and, and production variability and see how much that played out in terms of the different um, enterprises. And so then we did that, we so did those calculations and then we looked at how, how, how the outcome would occur for a farm that allocates its land across whether to be crops or livestock at different ratios across the farm. OK, so everything from a purely crop, crop focused farm where everything's in cropping, so a crop specialised producer or a livestock specialised producer, or where you've had different allocations of that farm to those different um, enterprises. No other interactions going on at all, just purely taking those economic outcomes and just adding them up proportionally across the farm effectively. So that's what we did. OK, so we used the models to generate that sort of analysis. So this is an example of the sort of output we generated in this case. So the left hand chart there is a frequency distribution histogram, just shows you the um, the annual, the distribution of the annual gross margins generated by the crop and the livestock enterprises that we simulated at Tamora, for example. And you can see there that the, the cropping enterprise has a much wider range of outcomes. There's some negative ones, there's some highly positive ones, and the livestock ones are all sort of centered around the middle. And so what you'll see on the on the right hand side, those were the estimated gr mean gross margins of the crop and the livestock enterprises each of the situations we modeled. OK, so four of the five sites we simulated, the cropping enterprise had a higher mean gross margin, right? So if you just looked at that entirely, you just go, well, we just grow our crops, don't we, at those sites? That's so, so everything we do. And equally, uh, Hamilton and Wakery, well, Wakery, it's not much different, so it's 50-50. Um, 
But then at Hamilton, you might be better off just having a livestock enterprise entirely based on the ones we simulated, of course. Right. So if that's all good, so that that sort of probably makes sense in some of those environments. Um, Hamilton probably traditionally did have more livestock enterprises in their production system. And at Wakery, where you're on the edge of the wheat belt, it probably could go either way, right? At least historically. So that's that's sort of what we generated. Um, now I'm going to show this 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 variable the conditional value at risk. So most of the people on the thing here will know what this means, but effectively what it does, what what it what we calculated was, if you took that broad broad uh, 30 years of simulations that we undertook, or 40 years of simulations, if you took the lowest 20% of those and you worked out what the average outcome in those lowest 20% of years were, this is what you would have generated. So that's called the conditional value at risk in this case at 20%, right? So take the 20% worst case cases and you average those outcomes, okay? Um, so you'll see us talk about this conditional value at risk because it's pretty effective I guess measure of your downside risk, what what you what you might lose in the worst case scenarios. And so what you'll see then in this case is the conditional value at risk is always higher in the livestock enterprise. So that means when the when 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 you get those crappy years, the livestock enterprise is more robust or more resilient to poor seasonal conditions or poor price conditions. Um, and so generates you a higher return in the worst situations than the cropping enterprise. Okay, so the livestock enterprise is, is is more buffered, I suppose, has less variance at least at the low end. So if you are worried about, if you wanted to then say, here's a different measure of risk that I thought I'd introduce too. It's condition. This is the coefficient of variation. So essentially, it's the ratio of the deviation of the outcomes against the mean. Okay, and so what you'll see here is um, when you have, I've just compared the sites and you can see how much um, difference in variability you have between the different locations, some with pretty low variability like Hamilton and some highly risky production environments like Wakery or Minipa, where you've got very high variance in production relative to your average. So it just shows you that different environments have quite different risk portfolios. Um, and what you'll notice though is when you overlay both risks, price and production, that's significantly higher than when you took either of them out. Um, so production risk is typically more higher at most locations except for Hamilton than price risk is. So the, the Hamilton case is more exposed to price risk, uh, at least in, in cropping systems, but also in livestock systems. And you'll see that the variability is lower in that livestock enterprise as well. So livestock enterprise is less variable than the cropping enterprise. <clears throat> so, so that's all good. We've, we, that sort of fits with common um, understanding. So now the question is, well, can we get the portfolio economics benefit? And so portfolio economics benefit means that if the two um, things you're investing in are not correlated, then they're, you're going to get a benefit likely from having a mixture of the two in your in your enterprise or in your investment. So here's a plot of the gross margin that's predicted from a livestock enterprise against the gross margin from a cropping enterprise. Every one of those dots is a particular year we simulated. And so the question is how well correlated or not are they? Okay, and so this plot just shows you that there's a very low correlation between the, out, the economic gross margin for each of those enterprises um, at Tamora, and the same is true at all sites except for maybe Charlton. There's a little bit of correlation at Charlton. So just shows you that there is a low correlation and potentially then scope for portfolio management that means you mitigate risk. So that's the case. If you want, that's that's across both price and production variable. If you look in the paper, we try to pull those apart and see if you still get the same thing. And the answer is yes, it, you do get the same portfolio economics thing, whether you're allowing production to vary or price to vary. And so there's there's mitigation going on in both both sides of that risk portfolio. <clears throat> and so the, then the question becomes, okay, can you come up with an optimal or what we call in the paper a risk efficient um, system. 
in terms of a balance between crop and livestock. So this is plotting that mean um, gross margin on the y-axis here against the cumulative, the conditional value at risk outcome that we would estimate. And the, the C and the L are the crop and livestock numbers, what I just showed you before, okay? And so the blue line, or the, the, the curved line, are the cases where you, all of the, the I guess, the, the, the combinations of balance between crop and livestock, okay? And so if that, if you would assume that if the, if there was no portfolio benefit, those things would be linear. There would be no, um, they just follow in a line between the two. So if it's on the right-hand side, you're generating more return per unit of risk um, than, than, if, than you would assume. So it's more risk efficient to have a, an outcome on the right-hand side of that line, okay? And so in this case at Tamora, what that showed is having as a, lot, as a farming enterprise of about 75 to 80% cropping and 25 to 30% livestock gives you the most risk efficient outcome as a farm. So you're actually generating more income per unit of risk in that situation than you would be if you chosen a specialist enterprise at one, one or the other, okay? So it's really about trying to understand the trade-off between risk and return you've got, and can you find a sweet spot in between the two? So that's what we tried to do here. Um, and so there's the plot from the paper which shows all the different sites. And I suppose what that shows is that at, at least four of the sites you get that curvature where you get a more risk efficient outcome. Um, and at a couple of the sites that's very linear. So you don't get the same risk efficiency benefit, I suppose, at all, in all circumstances. Um, and in some cases, it's very linear, like that there's no risk buffering to be had if you, you know, if you want to mix that up. And mostly that happened in cases where the livestock enterprise was equally profitable or very similar, had a very similar profitability, but still had lower risk in the case of wakery. So in that case, a livestock enterprise, at least as we simulated it here, would be a better off choice at Wakery no matter what you did. It's less, less risky and generated equal or higher gross margin. So why would you not choose that in this case? Not to say that that would be the case everywhere. So that's sort of what we did. Um, so what does this mean? I guess it highlights that production variability was more important as a source of risk than price variability across these businesses and enterprises. That livestock enterprises were generally less risky um, and their variability was lower. Um, so, you know, they, they, they had a risk mitigating benefit. Um, and on the other hand, cropping enterprises were often more risky. Um, but having a mixture of those two things generated a more stable income across a farm business, irrespective of whether you chose one or the other. Um, but what it did show is that that benefit or the optimum mix that you're going to have is going to be very location specific and probably very sensitive to the environment in which you're growing that system. And so I guess that leaves a big question about well, what are those circumstances? Um, the things that we didn't consider that are definitely worthwhile thinking about were the your gaps in what we did was we didn't consider the capital investment cost or labour investment costs associated with those two enterprises. They were pure gross margin or cash flow outcomes. Um, we only, those systems were static. So there was no ability for the system to adjust or tactically move between one type of enterprise to another, depending on season or price conditions. So, which, we, which was no, which is a good way of mitigating risk, right? They were static. So there's none of that happening. Um, and we know that soils and climate will vary substantially. And so, you know, there's a bit to understand a bit further there maybe about how much they play out. Um, and then there's questions about, well, are there other portfolio economic things that people could get in their farming businesses that might be beneficial? beneficial? So whether that be about the, the mix of crops that you grow and are there benefits there? I know there's been a bit done on that in local context, but I think there's a more general one. The mix of livestock enterprises that you operate, are there risk mitigation benefits there or are there other enterprises that could equally provide the same benefit? So there's some additional R&D that would be worthwhile thinking about. That's an overview from me. Um, feel, 
I'm sure some folks online here definitely will have some questions. I'll stop sharing. That's yeah. Lindsay. Um, for a man that said he'll talk for 20 minutes, he actually talked for exactly 20 minutes. So um, small applause for that as well. Well done. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you've got <coughs> a question or if uh, no, no hands are raised, just go ahead. Is that you, Marta? Yeah, I've got my hand raised. Um, well done, Lindsay. I quite like this kind of analysis. Um, obviously, you would be aware of uh, also reasonably recent whole, whole farm modelling studies done by uh, one by Afshin Garamani and Ross Kingwell, another one by Andrew Zoll and others around um, whole farm uh, diversification. And their findings was that uh, it's either a livestock only system, thereby removing the cropping overhead costs and all the big, big costs, or a shift to a more crop intensive system that would, would, would lower um, unit costs for cropping overheads, uh, perhaps complemented with other diversification from on farm or off farm income. So that's what they found. It's, uh, I mean, I, I am with you that integration probably has uh, synergies that, that, that probably is a good thing uh, going forward. Uh, but they both different studies, one in focus in Queensland, the other one, the WA, that's what they found. So um, have you, what's your so, comment on that? Um, well, two things. One is I think we didn't consider that capital investment thing. And yeah, so optimi optimizing, that. optimizing, your infrastructure cost per unit of hectare is obviously something that's clearly important. We just assumed it was the same, right? Yeah. Irrespective of the proportion of land that you had allocated to crop, right? So we know that would vary, but that's actually adds a whole level of uh, sophistication that you'd need to deal with. And yeah. we've actually got some work on that at the moment we're working on, but but that's a different thing, Mark. Um, so I think we didn't deal with that, right? So I think I think Ross's paper, if it's the one I'm thinking of, does capture that. I'm not sure Andrew's does. Um, the one thing we don't capture here are the interactions that happen between crops and livestock mm -hmm. in terms of price, uh, input cost mitigation, or or um, other other interactions that can happen. That we, we did that purposely. We wanted to keep that out yeah. of the game. This was purely about what the portfolio economic benefit is. Andrew and I actually have a paper that we've tried to look at those things. It's not as easy as it sounds. And hence, no. I actually think that doing those analysis where you capture all of those complexities is actually quite difficult to do well because there's so mm. many moving parts. It's hard oh, yeah, to sure. attribute the outcome. So that's my answer. I think we, we just we wanted to keep it fairly simple and focus on one thing. Um, and I think what it shows is our analysis, even though we only did six, it actually will show that there's a large, if we'd assumed a different soil or a different place, we probably might have got a different outcome. And so uh, I think to do this well, you'd want to increase the diversity mm. of environments and systems that you might capture and see how robust it is across yeah. those. That's to me the and bit that's missing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with you, but in that sort of analysis, you will always have the criticism. It's not my ex exactly my context. So it, mm. even though it's re reasonably yeah. uh, context specific, it won't please everyone because no, every and, every person has a different situation. So, so I my think answer that's is been, yeah. the assumptions that those guys made will be context specific too, right? <laughs> and so yeah, 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 of course, yeah. 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 So, but but that's been the ongoing criticism of these kinds of analysis that they always remain quite general in a way, even though they are very interesting and they explore the interactions in a very interesting way and quite sophisticated to some extent, that there's always that lack of connection to reality. Yeah. And that's that's been the problem with risk analysis of this kind in the past. Yeah. And uh, no, hopefully well, this project I mean, would be able to address it differently. Yeah, to some I extent. mean, we tried to make sure that those farm businesses that we tried to simulate were as representative as we could yeah, for I know, those I know circumstances. You, but but, yeah. but nonetheless, that's that's true. Right. All right, we'll move on to Ben with a hand up. And you're still muted, Ben, muted if you're talking. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lindsay. Nice, nice presentation. Um, if you look at gross margin, three elements, production risk, price risk and cost risk. Uh, 
Did you include that? And uh, second question, what's the evidence that farmers maximise conditional VAR? Yeah. That well, seems, well, ask you that it seems like <laughs> uh, to claim claim that seems like it's just sort of, yeah, I mean, I've, there's no basis for that. Um, they they might, ma you know, maximise, minimise something else. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so two, two answers to your question, Ben. So I guess. First one, well, yes, we, we obviously considered production risk as simulated by the model. Um, price risk as simulated by the historical record. Now, you could do that differently. You could use a Monte Carlo approach or something else, but we decided not to do that. Um, and the cost risk, well, the only varying cost we had was obviously was nitrogen cost in the system. And um, the others were assumed to be cons constant. Um, across the enterprise or per per hectare essentially right so so i suppose we didn't really capture the cost variance as much as the other two um but so so that's that's what we did better, for better yeah, so i mean there's with livestock and uh, and crop you know obviously as the if the wheat price is high or the barley price is oh. high then your feed costs are they also going drink. up so Ben, yeah. yes, you reminded me. Yes, so the supplementary cost that we associated, supplementary feeding cost, whether it be barley or lupins or whatever, for the livestock enterprise, those were sensitive to the price of the, yeah. the commodity of that commodity in that year. Yeah. Does that make so? So we did. Yeah. So we did account for that variance too in the livestock enterprise. But the other sort of, you know, the more, I guess, more fixed operating costs were kept held constant. Um, and usually the smaller cost items, I would say. Um, now, the second part of your question about this, whether CVAR is a helpful metric for actually informing farm decision making or not. Well, I guess the challenge is if 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 we want to try and quantify risk in some way, right? Whatever whatever that means, um, we've got to come up with some sort of metric which is somewhat meaningful for people, and so. In my experience, farmers are always interested in understanding what would have happened if 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 I had a bad outcome. Whether it changes their decision making or not is a different question, I think, and maybe something we could explore. Um, but whenever I've I've my experience with presenting that sort of risk analysis, because we do it in our farming systems research too, is that does hold value for them. They want to know how much have I got on the line if things don't go my way and that may that they may not change their decision making dramatically but it is something they consider um so i guess i think that's a pretty good metric of risk the cvar it, it's a pretty useful one um and i think um while it may not change their decision making it's definitely something i think that they fe that features in their in their broader uh consideration that's what i would say maybe maybe you've got different evidence ben but well i, I don't I mean, know probably uh, total yeah. total variance would be a more general me measure that that then assumes normality yeah. of the distribution to to pick things up i just i just don't know i mean I, there's no no evidence out there that says that you know people follow var or conditional no. VAR as a way of making it depends on the steepness of that slope you know uh, totally. you know if it was really <laughs> steep where you say well I'll I'll sacrifice a bit of mm. you know the CVAR uh, choice might be really suboptimal yeah you know in, the, in the past, maximizing CVAR yeah it, yeah, it is a challenge past, uh, yeah Go in the past to... we've also used oh sorry to budge in um in the past, we've also used a combination of risk metrics, uh, including CVAR and other things. Um, so the probability of making a profit, for example, a, a combination, and we just looked at the range, the 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 package of metrics. So yeah, we try that, but again, it's it's hard. It's it's hard to also to communicate. Um, uh, yeah, risk result risk analysis results to it. It's it's not easy. Well, and then uh, you bring in risk levels yeah. of risk aversion that will have risk premium, so that different again you get re different results for different levels of risk aversions so 
complex. I mean, my question, Ben, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a mere agronomist, right, who dabbles in, in farm economics, right? And so I guess I, I, I'm seeking out for a risk metric that I find is useful for communicating that context, right, that, that downside risk. And so it could be risk frequency of a crop failure, but that doesn't always work because, you know, sometimes you, how do you define a crop failure? Um, so there's always these challenges for how you do it. And so for me as agronomist, if I want to try and quantify the risk outcome or the relative risk outcome, it's actually about the relative risk outcome, um, I find that a not a bad metric to use. It's it, okay. whether whether it's meaningful, but it's about how relatively risky is option A versus B versus C and so on. Um, and you've got to be able to plot that against what the relative upside is. And so total variance to me is good, but that's it does it it's it's equally imperfect as well because it, it can be driven by upside variance as much as downside variance. So, I, 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 I agree with your comment. I mean, you've got to convey total variance. If you say, oh, well, the total variance of this, of mix A is higher than mix B to a farmer, they'll shrug. But you're con in the worst years, you're going to lose this amount. Yeah. I, I can see that as quite a, possibly quite a useful uh, intuitive measure. And, mm -hmm. and, and actually in financial economics, value at risk became quite fashionable you know in the in the early 2000s mm. through risk you know risk metrics and it was it was used quite widely in financial economics yeah well i mean that's where that's where andrew and i adopted it from i suppose and i was in the in the interest of trying to find some risk risk metric that we felt was useful conveyance of that and so we, that's what we've landed on and i i know it's say without any quantification of this having presented that sort of stuff to farmers for the last 10 years probably or five to 10 years once you convey what it really means i think they wrap their head around it reasonably well meaning it's 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 not a it's less ambiguous than some other risk metrics that we might use um and so i i, I find that at least they they understand what it means once you once you get rid of the 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 economic terminology and just explain it as the worst 20% of outcomes averaged. Um, and that has some value for them, I think. So, yeah, that, that's that's my experience. Yeah, without any qualification of that. I mean, you could you could uh, compare it with the um, you know with the mean the mean variance mm. optimum for different levels of risk aversion and you could also compare it I mean you probably have I, I, haven't, I haven't read the paper closely enough but compare it with the expected expected monetary value and see how close how close they are they might coincide you know so so you might find that you get very similar recommendations regardless of your uh, choice of a uh, risk yeah. measure yeah well actually the funny thing is Ben we actually did coefficient of variation as well which is essentially variance over mean. To and, yeah, total variance. Yeah. yeah, and so the optimum point for, for you know, if you if you plotted return against variance, whichever way you want to do it, they come out to be the same. So, you know, it's pretty robust in terms of the optimal outcome or most risk efficient is actually the same whichever metric you use. And I've done that for some of our farming systems research up here too. Same, you end up with the same optima. So, oh, that's robust then, isn't it? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apart okay, from a couple of a couple of crazy examples, but but that's but they are usually funny things happening. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So so I think the point of the reading club is to have discussions like this, where we think about how we're actually talking about and measuring risk. Um, so it's a a good example there. What are the metrics that we use um, to come through? Uh, a non-statistician, uh, completely ignorant question along those lines. Um, we talk about changing the conversation in risk-wise from just risk to risk-reward. Is, is, is there a conditional value of reward that would compare to that? Or how do, how do we actually look at not just downside but upside in this? And then I want to well, go to Ben, but is that too oddball? Well, that's what, well, Be Bre Brendan, I think that's, that's the mean gross margin in this case. And that's what we've used. 
So but that, that would be captures the top upside twenty percent of years would be a conditional value of reward, right? Say again, sorry. So if you were to flip it and say, yeah. if so, we know that there's a slight positive skew towards risk aversion based on the baselining we've been doing in risk wise. Yeah. So people might be also interested in what I get in the top twenty percent of years, not just the worst twenty percent of years. Would that be a useful comparison to have up there? Yes, you could. You could do it. I'm, I'm just. So I, I think if you're risk neutral, the means the, the thing you go with, right? If you're risk neutral, that's what you get. Well, this is my understanding of the of the the literature. If you don't care about risk, you just go with the thing that has the highest average outcome. Um, and so the average accounts for both the bads and the goods. And so if you have more goods than bads, well, you'll end up being higher, right? Um, and so I guess that's that's my. That's why I think the average is the, is the measure of the uh, of the return in this case. Um, if you're worried about the variance, both up and down, well, that's where CV does both of those things. Condition uh, the coefficient of variation. It tells you about how much variability around your mean do you have, um, and that's both up and down. Um, and so that's that's what I would have thought would be the outcome for me. So. Um, if you have a higher, if you have a higher mean and a lower CV, well, that's probably means that's a good thing too, right? Um, it's more stable and you're higher. Marty, you're muted. A risk, a yeah, risk low risk, high reward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're showing the conditional value of of risk for the risk averse. You've got yeah. the risk neutral, which you've covered, but what about the risk seeker risk that wants to good well, years? Yeah. Where I want to go with this. Yeah. Might, I'm just talking about how we flip the language within risk wise. We shouldn't be focused yeah. on downside. How are we going to picture the upside as well? But I won't drag on about it either. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose we just went with the with averages that case. But you could equally do an uh, with a, an upside thing and just you know it, there's an interesting experiment here to be had where you could actually go out and explain a few of these risk metrics to a bunch of producers around particular things and say, okay, which one's more meaningful for you? Surely someone's done that in the past. I don't know, but yeah, then maybe yeah, you've no. got the comment. <laughs> yeah, is my mic working? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious what you've used in your analysis for the livestock as a drought management strategy, um, because it seems that from one end of the country to the other, the strategy might be different. Um, and from high rainfall to low rainfall, the strategy might be different and would have huge effects on the profitability of the livestock enterprise? Um, so in all those cases, Ben, I think we just set it up so that we had the standard fee base of the farm, right, which had its costs and stuff. And then if the animals weren't, if if they didn't have sufficient feed, they meaning forage availability fell below a certain standard, I can't remember the number, it might have been a tonne per hectare or something, then we supplementary fed those animals to maintenance. Yep. So, and we used grain to do that. Yep. So you're, you're right, that will vary dramatically. Um, and how people deal with that is totally up to them. So actually, there'd be some producers who would have better draft management practices than that, and equally others that would have worse. Um, so, so I guess that's yeah. what we did. Yeah, and, those, so, and that would affect yeah what percentage they would have. You know, people who manage livestock better and manage droughts better probably have leaned to, more towards livestock and yeah. vice versa. And, and, but I think that's true of the cropping ones that we simulated too, because we've used AppSim in this case, and we're probably simulating production potential, okay? And there'll be cases where we will have simulated better outcomes for a wheat crop where actually a conservative farmer might have under fertilized that. Yep. So we're probably simulating more variance upside, particularly in the cropping enterprise in the way we've set up those simulations as well. So, you know, there's there's all the, the, the little combinations that you could unpack in there as well. So we we chose for, I think it was, I wouldn't say they were over fertilized by any stretch of the imagination. We chose a, a regionally robust nitrogen strategy, I think it was. So it probably isn't as much as you could put on yep. in some cases, which is perhaps why in Hamilton, for example, 
we mightn't have got the fertilizer at the at the level that you needed to reap the maximum benefit you could get from the cropping enterprise. That's quite possible. But we didn't explore that as a very for a thing. We 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 did a bit of early, you know, sensibility testing, I suppose, to make sure it was in the right scope. So you're right, there's lots of little knobs in there that you could play with to see whether or not that made a big difference or not. But that's within the cropping enterprise too, though, right? So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lindsay, you talked about um, a different paper uh, that might look more at the interactions between the two. Um, mm. Do you think the outcome would change markedly uh, if you incorporate the interactions or you still think that because livestock is a less risky enterprise, there's always going to be a skew towards livestock? Well, what we find in that paper that we haven't ever written up, but we should, essentially as you, so we tried to step up as you change your, I guess, your degree of integration. So the first one was, well, we talked about the optimal mix. Then we said, well, OK, if you then tailored your livestock enterprise to the parts of the farm where that's going to be more profitable and your cropping enterprise to the parts of the farm where that's more profitable, how much benefit do you get? And the answer was you increased income but the risk didn't change a lot, right? So the variance around that risk didn't change, but the income did because you're just getting higher average outcome on each parts of the farm. Then we said, okay, what happens if you then allowed for transfer of nutrients by crop rotation and or being able to graze a crop if you needed to? So I call that more tactical integration. And the answer was you actually increased outcome and gross margin dramatically at most sites quite substantially and the risk subtly went up right because you actually had more on the line then because you've got more uh stuff going on and then the final one was we tried to make that more seasonally so you could do that in a seasonal way so you if you had foresight of price and climate if you did that better and the answer was that just reduced risk but it in a very small amount of increase in profit. So, so I suppose that was showed is tactical, ta so more strategic changes around that actually increased risk, but increased profit. And then as you got more seasonally adjustable, you reduce risk again. So it was a funny sort of, I've got a few plots of that, but I don't remember my slides, but it is, it, that's what happened when you increased the level of integration you had between those enterprises. But that didn't happen the same everywhere either, by the way. It was subtly different everywhere. But more or less, that's what happened. So what that showed is, you know, seasonal tactical stuff is really good at reducing risk. Um, strategic decisions can have a big impact on return, but may not be positive on risk necessarily. Um, but actually, find, putting the right stuff in the right place is pretty important too. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah, and so that's a paper, and Andrew Moore, and I've got to finish bloody writing. It's only eight years late. Anyway, whatever. Sure. Uh, more questions from the floor? Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh, so just, uh, one very yeah, simple question. So, what what sort of uh, probability distribution you've assumed for uh, the the prices in your analysis, or it's just the? Uh, we didn't. We just we, took okay. the A we took the ABAR record of prices mm -hmm. that they've published in uh, AgSurf on an annual basis, and we then uh, adjusted those for CPI, so to bring them to twenty thirteen dollars. And so that gave us the the an annual price that we used over that same thirty years. Uh, but that was across the country, right? That wasn't regionally. So Ben's trying to do these regional ones and see how much variance and stuff it has. That was a fairly crude, I'd say, analysis of that variance. We didn't do a Monte Carlo either, Masood, so we didn't try and say, oh, well, yeah. price here and every year. We just, we just assumed that that was the price that you were exposed to. So it's a hind cast analysis, I suppose. Okay, in that regard. Good. thanks. Yep. Marty, you were going to uh, say something? Yeah, I was just going to go back to that risk aversion thing. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe another way of framing the the level of risk aversion is a neutral is around uh, maybe profit maximization is the only objective. 
Whereas if you've got any level of risk aversion, so you are you want to avoid income variation uh, as the main objective. So how much are you prepared to forego in terms of rewards to to have less risk? So that's really it can be framed in those terms. It's almost like the toss the coin to how much are you prepared yeah. to. So it's yeah, uh, it's really gam it, it's a gamble in a way. So so um, it can be framed note. in those terms. So one thing we I have done, Martha, not on this data, but I've I've plotted standard deviation against average, right? And so you get this nice curve, particularly across, which is the traditional sort of mitigation curve. And so if you have a risk neutral person, they're willing one and one on one. And so if you draw a tangent across it, you find the system that's on that point where one and one, one is to one, it's mm -hmm. the curve. Whereas if you're willing to do a two is to one, meaning you're you're willing to you want to mm -hmm. You want to weight you, downside more than yeah. by twice of your average, then you get a two is to one curve uh, of tangent, and you can get quite different places yeah. on the curve where you might land. Yeah, and yeah. then you can so figure you, out what the trade off is, what your opportunity cost from that risk aversion might yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. It's all about opportunity cost in the end. So yeah, how much so, are you so, yeah foregoing? So we we've done that with some of our cropping sequence simulations, but um, but we haven't done it in this case. But basically, yeah, it, it can be a way of framing this complex idea. Yeah. Playing with, some, sometimes yeah. it doesn't make any difference. It's so in the cropping, cropping, crop, cropping system stuff, yeah. what it showed is actually a risk averse and a risk neutral person would actually come up with the same outcome often. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Depending. Yeah. Ben, you've got another question or comment. <laughs> Except you're muted. You are, uh, you are muted. I'll get I'll get the hang of this technology one day. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, just a comment to Brendan. I, I just don't think for risk seekers this analysis doesn't just doesn't work uh, because they 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 want to choose uh, lower C vars. So uh, I mean I mean generally for risk analysis, risk risk seeking is viewed as somewhat irrational behaviour because you could con constantly offer them offer them unfair bets and they'd accept accept them and then be broke so i i think we you know in, in terms of risk uh in terms of risk wise you know the, the risk seekers are on their own um well you find them yeah. at the pub playing pokies bit <laughs> well that that's well, right they're, they're, the gamblers. Them, they're, the gamblers, they're gonna yeah. go bust so they're not going to be in yeah. business in a few years um they're going to uh, be very the, lucky the, otherwise <laughs> The second, the second comment, which might be an extension for what you're what, what you're doing, is, you know, between livestock and uh, cropping, then there might be more capacity for managing risk in the crop on the cropping side, in, in that you can engage in forward uh, futures contracts, and so that might be an add-on to say, well, can you change, can you increase CVAR by hedging? My yeah. guess is not very much, you know, because. Well, that, I think that's a question we can explore in this project, yeah. actually, is, is yeah, some of those, the degree that you can mitigate that risk through some of those sort of strategies. I mean, th this was a slightly different question, but I think it, it does pose some of those things where, as Ben pointed out before, there's a lot of little knobs you could tweak on each of those enterprises that changes their relative riskiness. Um, so I think that's something we could do, Ben, and we should do. Yeah, yeah, opinion. okay. Yeah, yeah. as well as, as, well as throw back. Yeah. Um, if we say that the grains industry, the backbone of the grains industry is maximising profit in the good years, surely we have to consider not just the downside, but the upside in that spectrum. So saying that risk seekers are on their own, wouldn't that go against the, the backbone that maximising profit in the good years is how the industry stays afloat? No. <laughs> so. No, because, because I guess the average account accounts for that though, Brennan. So if you get, if you get, yeah. So if if you've yeah. got a system system A right and it it has high upside, that will drag the average up. Yeah, right, but, but, but wait the same is true of a downside. Yes, but but what seems to be, people weight the downside more is is the mm. vernacular. Ben was telling me about whether that's true. Well, <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But but um, 
I guess a, a risk neutral producer would just go for the higher average and that captures the big upsides when that happens. And even though it might only happen one in 10 years or one in 20 years, they'll go, the, but they're not going to necessarily go for that. You know what I mean? They're not, they're, the, I don't know, how many how many farmers are risk seekers, I suppose is the question. That's so the, there's that's, a spectrum from complete yeah. risk seeker to complete risk avoidant, and then there's the middle, which is yeah. your risk neutral. So, so are we saying that we just lump five through five through ten all as one group, and then it's only a spectrum of downside? I don't know. Well, no, no. It's just just if right if you do an experiment and you ask people questions about their risk aversion, then almost a hundred percent of any group will actually come up as being risk averse and risk neutral. Risk risk seeking. If you look at the definition of it, is extreme, quite extreme, risky behaviour. Now it's like, it's like re, you you'd be tend, you tend to sort of gamble to the extent that you lose all your wealth. No boundaries. Basically. No, yeah, that's right. No so boundaries. so so a risk a risk seeking farmer would might emerge as being risk neutral because they're constrained mm. by other things. So they yeah, yeah. they just they'd be a corner point. They wouldn't care about conditional value at risk now they 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 just maximize expected profit or do something even weirder you know like like push that so that they lost money in bad really lost money in bad years and perhaps made a lot of money in some good years but that would actually mean on average that they they'd be worse off and yeah, okay. right. a, a, a losing their wealth through time I'm losing. I can tell I'm losing the battle here, but I say we're talking about a ten, and then we're talking about five, and we're talking about nothing between five and ten on that spectrum. Well, but I can see defeat, and I do not wish to bore the room further. Yeah, I'll um, give you. I'll give you some reading, Brendan, if you want well. some. <laughs> but um, yeah, as we come to the close, anyway, we we'll probably yeah. um, think a little bit about what. So, what does this mean for risk-wise? Um, maybe just quickly back to you, Lindsay. You mentioned things like you know the importance of tactical decisions. Um, and risk rather than the others. Um, there's a little bit maybe still to unpack around, you know, downscaling this sort of academia to what does it mean to grow groups and otherwise. But did you have some final points to um, for people to take away? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think there's a couple. One, one is I think I want to, one of the things I want to share that CBAR and get people at least think about it who's here. And then, as Ben said, whether it's a useful one or not. But I think we've got to have a discussion about what our what the appropriate measures of risk are that we're going to try and quantify whether, whether across the program, right? So that's one. So I started a discussion about that. Um, and I find that one a good one. So introducing that. Um, and I think there's a few questions there that some of the groups are interested in around enterprise choice and enterprise mix. And so I guess this doesn't answer all of those questions, but it gives a platform upon which we might be able to explore some of those questions. And so whether they be, like Ben said, about um, uh, how those things play out on, on tweaking the dial on the risky profile of a cropping enterprise and how that stacks up um, is, is, you know, is important stuff I think we can explore relative to other options. So that, that's what I think. That, 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 was, that was, I think, a couple of take homes from my perspective. Um, yeah. Excellent. And I wanted um, to give you a bit of an example of, of a case of what sort of things we can do in this sort of from a national perspective in terms of these sort of coordinated analyses that we might apply. I wouldn't pick that one again, but in a similar way. Can you think of examples that you might do similar to this for risk wise off the top of your head? Uh, well, I think that question that Ben, ben did run about, well, the degree of mitigation of uh, price risk that you could achieve would be interesting across the country from from well from a whole range of different perhaps strategies and how much does that play out or not does it shift that risk profile and how much um equally i think there's some stuff around uh, and i think an under understated thing that people forget about is the diversification that you can get from just growing a mixture of crops um, in your farm business and so whether you've grown the balance of canola, lupins, wheat and other things like people get fixated on the agronomics of that and often forget about the risk mitigation benefit of that. Um, like what? So, yeah, like, likewise for livestock feed options available yeah, to help to, yeah. to close that feed gap, which is a big, big yeah. uh, weakness in the system. 
these mixed so systems. It's the so same, but, also, yeah. but from a grain production perspective, I think that's mm -hmm. an often yeah. understated benefit yeah. that you can get from having th those systems. They're more complicated and often more complex. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have an upside. So working out what that is. Um, and some crops are more risky than others, right? And so building that in, both on the upside and the downside. So certain certain legume crops, at least in our part of the neck of the woods, can go from $1,000 a tonne to 400 in three months. <laughs> so that that's a yeah, hard thing yeah. to manage. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, I'm um, seeing as some of the other risk-wise meetings went long, if we um, stop this one two minutes early, we'll start to apply back everybody's time. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm talking, I can even find that little applause thing. But thank you, Lindsay, for presenting thanks, and Rob. thanks people for participating in. That's if good. you have a paper that you know of and a presenter that you know of to um, to do one of these sessions, please reach out and let me know so we, we keep the ball rolling. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining. Thanks, Brendan, for wrangling. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Brendan. Thanks very much. Bye. See you. Bye. See you, everyone.